All right. And so that's, I mean, that's getting back to the substance of what is going to come out. Cause I, I suspect we haven't seen the tip of the iceberg yet, but everyone's asking how can these social media platforms censor with impunity? Uh, which I guess in a way it brings us into the section 230. You know, the, the, the long lead up to that was they all knew it was coming. They were ready for this. And I guess, you know, they, they knew where to block it and how to block it, how to, I mean, they, they have the ability to suspend accounts left, right, and center, which they were doing. Anybody who shared the story, um, actually funny thing, which might explain why I forget which lawmaker it was who asked ACB during the hearing, the whole two minute hypothetical question about a vice president's son, which I thought was inappropriate during the hearing, but it would be difficult to ban people for sharing that soundbite on Twitter uh, without looking like you're censoring actual government information, which might make you liable. How, how do they do it with impunity? And at what point do they, at what point are they held to account? And on what basis could they be? So two things there. Historically, big tech has been planning for this day for a long time, but especially since Trump's rise. So they met uh, on an island outside South Carolina in February of 2016 to brainstorm how to do this. The agreement at that time was that Trump couldn't win the general election, so they weren't going to put their foot on the side either way and so that nobody could accuse them of it. But they wanted to be in a position to do so. And they had been working with the Chinese government to how to leverage their uh, monopolistic controls to suppress and censor information and attract people for a social credit score type system. This started getting leaked out by dissident members of Google, dissident members of Facebook they st over the years. Um, the But they still planned on going this route. Now, for those further back, like when you're talking with Eric Hunley, uh, who for folks out there does a great podcast, the Unstructured Podcast. You can follow it on YouTube. Did a great interview with uh, Viva last week. He does great interviews with those behavior panel people there. Just he, and and he did a great interview with John McAfee, which <laughs> which yes, my, which apparently and, and I'll explain why John McAfee is assuredly innocent, but I'll explain that a little bit later. No, we're getting we're getting there. <laughs> exactly. But back to the true corruption uh, of section two of big uh, big tech and how section two thirty has been misused. So they put that in practical motion. Then going all the way back though to that question that was on the Eric Hunley, an unstructured show. It is true that the internet was originally created by DARPA, the defense industry, in order to have secure communication. And then it became used for privatized purposes in the late 80s, early 90s. A great, uh, I think it's Hold and Catch Fire or something like that. It's a great TV series that basically does a dramatic cinematic narration of the whole big tech revolution from 1985 through 2000. It even has a basically a McAfee component, though it's a different character. It's basically that component. And, and it tells it well through these different stories and tells it really well. I think it's Hold and Catch Fire or something like that. I'll find the link and, and put it in the uh, comments in the description below. Uh, but the uh, so effectively, it went from the original assumption was that they were going to gather information, not censor and suppress, because the intelligence agencies didn't want them to do that. This was an exceptional means of tracking people. This is why like, people are shocked that there's these huge voter files on them that predict what they're going to do. And they're like, that can't possibly be true. They don't realize that everything about your life has been digitized and monetized uh, for some other company to have on you. You give me your name. I can basically pretty quickly figure out what newspapers you subscribe to, what you like on Facebook, what you comment on on Twitter, what your voting history is, what your property holding history is, who lives at your home, what church you donate to, what school you, 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 you go. I mean, you name it. I mean, just a wide range of activities that become pretty effective at some point of forecasting who you are. I know because I sort of tested this on a personal basis just to see how well they could advertise to me on Instagram by liking things I like. And it's like freaky how good they are. They like come up with stuff that I'm like, wow, that's fascinating. Wow, that's fascinating too. And I'm like, man, these guys are good at this. So that's how good the algorithm is. The, the, the Facebook joke is if you like five things, Facebook knows you as well as a distant relative. If you like 10 things, Facebook knows you as well as a friend. If you like 20 things on Facebook, Facebook knows you as well as a family member. And if you liked 50 things on Facebook, they know you better than your spouse does. That's the Facebook sort of mantra. The whole goal was the, the monetization of your private information. Now, censorship doesn't fit into that. So the intelligence apparatus in the United States originally did not want the big tech involved in censorship. And when they passed the Communities De uh, Decency Act, Communications Decency Act in the mid-1990s, the, the Section 230 that was part of it, the whole goal was we want America to win the big tech race. So we're going to immunize you so that you can't get sued. Uh, as long as you're acting in good faith and you're acting as a platform, not a publisher, so on and so forth. 
But it never anticipated because the backstory that everybody on Congress and the Hill knew was that the goal was to gather massive information on people, which is useless if they're censoring, because then they're driving people underground. So they never thought that would happen. The What changed was 2008, Obama wins. He wins heavily thanks to big tech. There's new stories about how big tech was working with his campaign secretly behind the scenes because big tech has so much information on what people are thinking, what people are motivated by. Their algorithms are incredibly accurate at understanding what's likely to occur. Uh, they always thought it would work that way because it worked that way in 2012. Then all of a sudden Trump comes along. And they think it's just an anomaly. When Trump wins, they're shocked. Soros is enraged. He starts shorting big tech stock, starts asking con con Congress to open up investigations to accuse them of enabling foreign interference. So they're getting pressure from that side uh, and they're getting pressure internally because their entire professional class of engineers and lawyers and staffers are all to the progressive social justice warrior left. Um, it, it's the reason why Joe Rogan is currently having problems at Spotify. There's an internal revolution at Spotify against allowing the most popular podcaster in the world to have on who he wants to have on and broadcast what he wants to broadcast. So the, uh, which means Spotify lied to the world, by the way, if they don't fix that, the big lawsuits come into Spotify because they made billions of dollars promising that they were going to have an uncensored Joe Rogan on. Well, and, and that's I, why their stock went up. I, I suspect they will have inducement problems with Joe Rogan if he's not going there so that he can meet more censorship than he's leaving and presumably verify this information before moving. Um, okay, yeah, sorry, sorry, continue. So, yeah, so that's the backstory to what's happened. The legal pretext was Section 230. Now, I was on uh, Jordan Belfort's show last week. I think he's going to publish it, you know, in the next week or two. Uh, for folks who don't know, that's the man that Leonard DiCaprio played in the movie The Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, fascinating guy, brilliant salesman. I mean, truly brilliant salesman. That guy could sell ice to an Eskimo, as the old saying goes. The uh, uh, just uh, and I, I and as I explained to him, I have had good fortune in my life to represent a lot of innocent clients. And if I had represented him, he would have been innocent too. The uh, but uh, he, I forgot until he brought up. He said Section Two Thirty is all about me, and I was like, what? Stratton. And he was like, exactly. I had not put it together. I, I've got to say, I'm 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 ashamed. I might lose. I might get haters. I've never seen The Wolf of Wall Street, but I I know I know everything about it. I've read the I've read the synopsis. I've just never actually been able to sit down for three hours to watch the movie. <laughs> it, it's Scorsese, in my view, so it's Scorsese's best movie. Basically, he's he's describing what he does brilliantly cinematically is describe how easy the trap and the destruction of depravity can be. That once you get into a certain lifestyle, it can slowly consume you. It's initially seductive, but ultimately destructive, which is actually Belfort's main theory and theme about his own life and his redemption story. Um, I would have had more of his redemption story in the movie. That's the only difference. Um, but because he's amazingly managed to do that. The uh, uh, fascinating, fascinating guy. And just pure, he's like Scott Adams level persuasion analysis. So I recommend it for anybody to you know, go to his sales school and whatnot. The, uh, and he still has to give back money to the, the people. It was funny. He's sitting there telling me, he's like, yeah. So, you know, I, and I realized then, so for folks who don't know, Stratton Oakmont sued Prodigy, or Prodigy and, and for those of us young, old enough to remember, I mean, that was big back then, AOL and all that jazz. In, two, in 1995, because on the boards, they were accusing uh, Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street, of being involved in fraud. And, and Belfort laughed. He said, you know, I sued and had a great suit against him. He said, of course, what people were saying was actually true, but <laughs> we had a defamation claim at the time. So, the, uh, so basically people were outing him. Uh, it went up to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit said Prodigy is not immune. I always knew it as the Prodigy suit. That's how I remembered. But then when he mentioned it, I was like, oh, yeah, Stratton Oakmont. The, uh, so it was actually his company. A senator read the story about that and was so enraged that the senator demanded uh, a, a change in the law so that guys like Jordan Belfort could not sue a company like Prodigy for what someone actually outed him for doing on board. So that's how Section 230 gets initiated. Now, what happens afterwards is that the courts interpret Section 230 to be a blanket immunity for big tech across the board. And actually, just, just to put a pause in there, um, there were two, I forget the name of the other decision now, I'm going to forget, I think it was CompuServe, where there were two, two oh. decisions which were sort of similar at the time. Prodigy, where Prodigy actually made an effort to moderate some of the content on their website. And because they didn't remove this defamatory article, Notwithstanding the fact that they said they do moderate, 
they were held liable. This other one, CompuServe, said we don't make any attempts to moderate any of the content. And so whatever's on there is not our problem, none of our business. And they, under similar circumstances but not identical, were not found liable. And so, um, sorry, the idea was then that you're you're actually penalizing people who are trying to do the right thing uh, and letting off the hook those who are not even making an attempt. And that was the underlying reason to say under Section 230, if you try to create guidelines and try to bring off illegal content, you won't be held liable if you don't, if something slips through the cracks. And nor will you be held, nor can you be held liable for attempting to enforce it and ensure that illegal content does not end up on the platform that you are offering. Um, and at the time, I think it was illegal content, not uh, offensive content in the sense that anybody's using it now uh, in, in YouTube. So that was that was part of the backdrop was Section 230 was an attempt to uniformize or, you know, make logical what a principle that didn't seem logical at the time was if you make an attempt, you'll be held liable. If you don't make any attempt and you leave all the crap up, you won't be held liable. Um, exactly. Yeah, so, so the there were two back then. The idea was uh, if you exercise editorial privileges in a First Amendment conforming manner, they didn't use that language. But if you look at the substantive provisions they're talking about, they're saying you make a good faith effort to moderate, to exclude, and they list a bunch of categories. They're describing things that are unprotected by the First Amendment, violent conduct. Uh, but they, even then they say extremely violent conduct, uh, the uh, uh, harassing conduct, stalking conduct, conduct uh, uh, pornog certain kinds of pornography, et cetera. Um, and they provide for certain protections and take them out and put them in. But what happened is the courts interpreted it as, hey, Congress is telling us they want big tech protected for political reasons, economic reasons. So we're going to protect them across the board. And the way that expanded, first it started out a slow expansion. The second way was I've been debating uh, a bunch of big tech professors, well, uh, purportedly professors, law professors, think tank people for the last five years on this. And they always attack me and they say, there's no such thing as a publisher uh, uh, platform distinction, da, da, da. What happened is Google and the rest bought up all the think tanks and many of the professors. What a lot of these law professors don't disclose is who is donating to their foundation at their law school or donating or that they're a private consultant for on the side. They, they There was no money on the side of the people wanting to control big tech, tons of money on the side of big tech. So they bought off the reason, uh, the you know, you the you like uh, your, your reasons. The reason why Robbie Sove, I think it's Robbie Sove. Uh, the so, guy you're yeah. talking about, you know, thing. the reason why he's commenting on that, he works for Reason. Reason is heavily influenced by the Koch Foundation. The Kochs are on the big tech side. And that's why Reason, aside from, you know, pretending that Judge Barrett is going to be a great civil rights advocate on the Supreme Court, is uh, pretending that uh, is mad about this issue because they don't want big tech to be controlled or censored because they're in big tech's pocket. That's why the you know leading libertarian foundations are in big tech's pocket. Almost the entire law school, almost every lawyer or law professor that's blogging on this is in big tech's pocket. And that's why the what so what the judges saw was, hey, all the legal academy and experts agree that Section 230 was really meant to just immunize everything. And so I came up with two lines of attack about four years ago. One line was to try the constitutional route, which was the old argument uh, following a line of decisions from both California and the United States Supreme Court that said when a private a company chooses to monopolize part of the public square, they're bound by the First Amendment. It became very clear that I, that that line of suits had zero chance. And it's so, interesting. I, I've been following this long enough to have found seen that trajectory. Prager, you didn't get away with it. Tulsi, get away with it. It made no headway with Prager, you. It made no headway with Tulsi Gabbard, and it, it became clear they're not going to accept that argument. They're not. They're private enterprises. They are not town square. They are not corporate cities. So it's not going to go anywhere, and it didn't go anywhere, right. which is when you know people no. have to go to second line of attack. I still think it should. But that's different from the reality that it ain't. So the uh, it, it, I, I compare it to Indian treaties. You know, they look good on paper, but good luck when the cavalry comes.
So the this is the reality of situation uh, of that aspect of that argument. I think theoretically, conceptually, I still stand by my position because I think when and for all those who are like, well, what about some little company that's now going to be thrown out of business because they have to regulate? No, this only would apply if you have monopoly power. You have to have at least 75 to 80 percent. That's the historical metric under antitrust laws of that market space. Google has that in its space, both YouTube and Google search. Facebook has that of its space. Twitter has that of its space. And my view is once you leverage that degree of power and what you're doing is the public square, you should be bound by the First Amendment. But folks, it, it ain't flying. It ain't going anywhere. It's dead. And it's especially dead after what Justice Thomas wrote, because what Justice Thomas made, he didn't go down that road at all. So that means that road is closed. Now, the second road I was trying to go down was to resuscitate common law theories of civil liability and say that just because you're big tech doesn't mean you shouldn't be held to the same standards of contracts and torts as every other mom and pop company in the world. So if you make a promise to somebody, you have to keep it. If you get unjustly enriched, you got to return it. If you are uh, violating people's consumer principles or assumptions or expectations, you can be held liable under Consumer Practices Act laws. Uh, unfortunately, that too has been shut off until what Justice Thomas wrote. And the because I figured that would be the second path to solution because all of these companies have lied to induce their monopoly power. They I also think antitrust laws, I, I agree with Matt Stoller and others, need to be resuscitated against these companies because they've clearly leveraged their uh, the, I mean, the argument in the various suits that are being brought against them now, the antitrust investigation they're under, state attorney generals, U.S. Department of Justice, are all very legitimate and justified because they've leveraged their antitrust power to increase their power over another sector of, this, of the economy. And that's what antitrust law prohibits. But putting that aside for the moment, the other claims should all be because they promised things. I mean, Twitter said we're going to be the free speech wing of the free speech party. They did so to induce people to monetize their information, their connections, their associations, which made Twitter rich, gave all of Twitter's money, came from that activity, and then turned around and broke the promise to be the free speech wing what, of the free speech party. And you know what, I, I've got to, I've got to mention it like. Uh, Jack comes out at the beginning of when this election cycle started and says, we're not taking any, um, we're not taking any campaign ads or political ads on our platform. We're going to remain neutral and not, I think like, you remain neutral. And then some people were asking this question is what they did, not a contribution in kind to the campaign to censor, uh, you know, negative material. Um, it was sort of a, actually a tongue in cheek question, but is what they did, what they did cannot be considered to be anything tangible in terms of uh, donation. If you use the democratic standards, it is a violation. Now, my view is there's a lot of First Amendment restrictions on those campaign finance laws. So I'm not in favor of a broad interpretation of those laws because the probability they get interpreted in a way that favors ordinary people against the elite ain't high. So the uh, so that's my view. I didn't I did like for the when they said Donald Trump Jr. had a meeting and received information from a foreign. So I was like, I don't it's like that's hogwash. That's all First Amendment protected activity. So the and I feel the same here that it's probably First Amendment protected activity. Um, unless unless one exception, if you're explicitly coordinating with the campaign, then that's considered a campaign donation. And that and the, and the value of what they did way exceeds what they can legally contribute. No, so I, that's no. why an FEC complaint would be valid. Okay, now that's very interesting because there is if there is not an FEC complaint yet, con Congress is talking about congressional subpoenas, which might, which might, assuming nobody's deleted emails because they haven't received a subpoena yet, might evidence coordination. We'll see. No point hypothesizing on that. Um, but actually, sorry, I, I, we got off the topic. Justice Thomas re releases that ten-page opinion. My first question in that. Oh, do, do you want to add something first? No, 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 go, go ahead. Okay. My first question with Justice Thomas's opinion is how and why? Because we're sitting there watching Amy Coney Barrett all week talk about how I'm not giving opinions on hypotheticals unless there's a court file, a, a briefed file. It's it, we don't want to indicate how we're going to adjudicate on things. And then with you know, and then out of the blue for no good reason, in denying a petition for writ of certiorari, Justice Thomas issues a ten-page advisory opinion, unsolicited opinion, nonetheless. So. Why did he do it? How did he do it? And was it wrong to do it in the first place? So about five years ago or so, give or take, me, I, I and some other lawyers came up with this idea of these two paths attacks, and they mimicked my lawsuits in a range of cases across the country. 
and initially actually prevailed in a San Francisco trial court and the Court of Appeals in California, of course, stepped in very quickly and reversed. Um, but it showed the possibilities because what we did is we looked at every single theory of attack, which ones had had any chance of success. And we found that some commercial attacks uh, had worked, but not for ordinary consumers, just for. And I was like, well, logically, it would extend. So a lot of those cases, uh, they have brought up to the Supreme Court and the petitions were not granted. But it's one of the reasons why I tell people whenever you have a chance to file something to the U.S. Supreme Court, do it. Doesn't matter if your chance is one in a thousand. So that's why I'll file three or four this year, at least have filed dozens over the years, even though it's expensive. It's like five grand just to print their little you have to print a little thing that's like nine copies of it and a special little leave it to the Supreme Court. Always have to print something special. Can't just do something normal. Um but the but it's worth it because they read all of those and at least they're in their clerks often read them. So if you keep hammering away at them, even if they don't take your case, you're going to start to see justices say, hold on a second. It's also why you argue in the court of public opinion. You keep hammering and hammering and hammering a thematic structure so that because they, because every as Sullivan eminently reveals on the bad side of the aisle, uh, judges pay a lot of attention to what's going on in the court of public opinion. So the uh, so that's why it's important to do so. It's also important sometimes to keep your mouth shut too. So it depends on the case. The, uh, so, the, uh, so that's why it was good. And I think Thomas had seen those and he borrowed the second line. So he, he, he's like, ah, first line's not going anywhere, making it constitutional, making him a quasi-government. I, well, that's just not working. It's not likely to work with my colleagues. Drop it. And he's what he's doing is the reason why he issued it is he's giving a roadmap for everybody out there. He's saying, hey, the second road is viable. I, as a Supreme Court justice, think it's viable. You can now cite it to every court in the country, state court, and federal court in the country. And I'll, I'll be the only Supreme Court opinion on the subject at this point that says, here's why this logic and this path should actually reform what happened? Because his point is, this was never intended. There's been a big lie told by the legal academy that's in the pocket of big tech. Uh, that the that this was intended to be a blanket carte blanche immunity. No, it wasn't. They these companies got rich by lying to their consumers, lying to them about what they were going to do. Nobody would have joined Facebook rather than MySpace if Facebook would have said, "By the way, in the future, we will randomly censor your content, we will randomly manipulate your algorithm, and we'll monetize your private information, including your kids' private information, for our personal profit." Would, would people have gone to Facebook then and said, no, there would be no big Facebook. MySpace would have dominated. Twitter similarly would have lost. Uh, YouTube similarly would have lost. Google similarly would have lost. I mean, I mean, Google, I mean, YouTube makes its money off of its contents, of its creator's content. Now, YouTube does nothing but provide a platform for it. If How many people would have joined YouTube rather than any of the other competitors 10 years ago if YouTube would have said, by the way, we'll randomly cut off your monetization, we'll randomly uh, use the algorithms to drive down uh, dr searches for your content, or maybe we'll just overnight destroy your accounts like we did last week to anybody who mentioned certain Biden information or uh, to a whole bunch of QAnon accounts. And I've been very public about not being a fan of QAnon theories and strategies. I am a harsh critic of any effort to censor them. It, it's, uh, it, it's an amazing thing, actually, just to highlight the injustice. Even when they demonetize a video because it's, the video itself is inappropriate, that content creator is still driving people to the platform, driving them to other videos, which themselves are monetized. It is patently a case of enrichment or unjust enrichment. Unjust. Absolutely. So um, now I just. So what Thomas did is he laid out, and you did a good video on it. Thomas lays out, hey, by the way, this is a viable path. This Section 230 was never meant to be this broadly expanded. In fact, it's a contradictory reading of the statute. You can't read the whole statute and come up with the interpretation all these courts have come up with. And that this has been bad logic adopted by the lower courts. And I think we should, as a Supreme Court, make it clear. But what he's hoping is district courts pick up on it. Courts of appeals pick up on it. State courts pick up on it. So that it starts to breach the impregnable wall of Section 230 so that they, what I used to, what I argued in court, and I picked a case where I had a Republican judge, a Republican jury. She still shut me down. I ended up getting a good settlement from Twitter just because Twitter didn't want me to appeal it all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court because I, I was making arguments they didn't realize the resonance of until even the judge recognized them. Um, but the judge was like, hey, politically, there's too much power behind what the it, it, what Justice Thomas did was sh it was change the power equation. All the power had been on the side of big tech so that every judge who even think about challenging him was like, I can't find a single opinion that says you're right, Mr. Barnes. They all say you're wrong. Why am I going to be the one to buck them? Now I have Justice Thomas saying the only Supreme Court justice to comment on it saying I'm right. 
So that means that for, and there's been massive violation by uh, uh, of consumers' rights and content creators' rights, and maybe systematic and systemic election law violations, though that has limit, limited legal remedy to the FEC. But the other two should be actionable. There has been massive unjust enrichment by all of them. They got rich by lying to people. It's, it's an amazing it's an amazing thing. People in Canada, we have the criteria for unjust enrichment, which is uh, enrichment, correlative impoverishment and an absence of any contractual reason for, for the for that to exist. In this case, it's like it's beyond that. It's almost it, false inducements. Like you say, nobody would have gotten on on YouTube, the free speech platform, put up your content so they can build their brand, build the, the entire platform. But if they don't like your stuff for political or ideological reasons, just demonetize it, shut you down, shut your account down. Um, but the one thing is. Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas did not, it, there's nothing unethical about the opinion that he issued. Oh, no, not at all. So justices do this all the time. So now Thomas actually has a longer history of doing it, uh, though sporadically. I took a Fifth Amendment case to challenge the scope and scale of the meaning of the self-incrimination clause uh, because Justice Thomas had and Scalia had joined. And Scalia used to do this. Uh, Ginsburg on occasion would do it. Back in the old days, the great jurists like Black and Douglas would frequently do it. So it was just a way of sending a signal and sending a message. So you'll often see these quote unquote concurring opinions. Remember Roberts wrote a concurring opinion on the church case on the pandemic, giving well, a road a, a concurring opinion with an existing opinion I can understand, but when they're just dismissing a petition for writ of certiorari or certiorari or whatever, cert, they're saying we're not hearing it, but here's what I think on the non-substance of a case that doesn't exist before me. I was just wondering if it was not tantamount to giving an opinion on a non-existent hypothetical case but uh, no, because it, it's the reason they you they used to actually publish more dissents and concurrences on cert petitions. So there used to be more explanation of why they didn't take a case but would take a future case, why they didn't take a case, things of that nature. So there used to be more of that. The about 20 years ago they started like it used to be the protocol that Supreme Court justices had complete carte blanche over their circuit. So for those who don't know, each of the Supreme Court justices are assigned circuits. Now, there used to only be nine. Now there's more. So a justice will have more than one circuit. But they used to write their own opinions. They used to write their own bail decisions, which was fantastic back in the day. Now they have a custom and protocol that they refer it to the whole court, uh, which I think is a wuss move. Uh, I think they should be writing independent decisions because they get to. And so injunctions, for example, would be decided by the single justice assigned that circuit. I think that's great. I think that's fantastic. I think that you, we would have more diversity of opinion. Uh, what is they didn't want a conflict. So the uh, and so consequently, they agreed by consent to basically be lazy and have to make the whole court write one. And then while well, that did is reduce the number of opinions being written each year. But technically, what yeah, so what he did has no problem whatsoever. It's it's pretty once it, it's a live case in controversy when the petition for cert's been filed. Now, if he'd written an opinion about something when no petition for cert was filed, that would be problematic. Okay. Uh, but but once it, it was a live case in front of him, so he could say anything he wanted, even though they were denying the cert. And, and and by and large, all all he did was summarize the history, summarize the case law, and indicate. Uh, I mean, I guess indicate to some extent his interpretation of what the intent was versus how the courts are are uh, interpreting it. And obviously, the case they had before them was a very unique case because it relied on a separate section of Section Two Hundred and Thirty, and immunity was denied in that case. So it's sort of really not the best case to set the example, but clearly was the the roadwork or the roadmap for a future case. And what they would have to argue to get to get up there and to to make a point, um, is it not? Is uh, my question was I think I know the way I feel. My answer. I'm curious to know your thoughts. Is it is what Twitter and Facebook did not election interference? And if it isn't, why mm -hmm. isn't it? Is is anybody going to do anything about it? Two things with that. There's election interference as an objective empirical reality, and then there's election interference as some form of illegality. It's not probably election interference as some form of illegality unless there's been coordination and it's an in-kind campaign to no donation that's been undisclosed and in excess of the limits. Um, it's uh, I'm not a fan of the of trying to make a quote unquote election interference criminal because at some point you start to criminalize speech. Uh, and so that's my concern with that. So to me, the key is factually now as an objective matter, they're absolutely trying to impact the election. So it's a form of election interference. And to the degree that people describe or define intellectual interference as A, trying to influence an election and B, doing so by deceptive means, this clearly fits that category.
So it's it's empirically and objectively election interference. That's just not criminal for good reason because of the First Amendment constitutional constraint that cabins the limit the application of that law, unless it's deliberately coordinated and and basically an in kind donation that's undisclosed and in excess of the limits. Mm-hmm. Um, now I do think that what they did uh, is going to empower uh, though its critics. Um, and I think it, it also, by the way, it tells me something politically, which I'll comment on in the more detail in the People's Pundit Daily Show uh, each Monday at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. But uh, I, they would not have taken this gamble if they thought Trump was a, a lock to lose because they knew doing this would blow up in their faces. They knew they would get massive criticism and massive blowback. Um, and yet they did it anyway, which, by the way, tells you how true it is. Because if they really thought a detailed inquiry would show that these were bad journalistic methods that showed that there was no verity or validity to this, then they let it take its own path and say, oh, see, this is another crazy fake news story from the critics of of Biden's critics. Instead, they were paranoid of anybody paying any attention to this, tried to suppress it and censored it and considered it more risky for the truth of the story to be revealed than for the truth of their censorship to be known. I mean, the, the, the censorship just, it made no sense. We're not, we're not idiots. It comes out without any explanation. The explanation is an ever moving target of, uh, we, the, uh, personal information, hacked information, false information, all of which are basically mutually exclusive explanations. Um, okay. So, I mean, I think, I think we've covered that. I mean, it's, it's interesting. So the two thirty issues that, um, uh, that Clarence Thomas raised now gives a, a sort of a road, a roadmap to how people can attack 230, hopefully have the court set the right precedent, failing which it was Suave's uh, criticism as well. By the way, is reason left or right for someone who doesn't know? It's libertarian, and I call it the mouthpiece of the Koch brothers, but okay. the, uh, that, that, that's my version of it. So, so Suave's cris- criticism was that this is just going to empower the wrong people regardless. And uh, it's just yeah, if- you mean it's going to empower people like me. So the, we have our specific disagreements on this. And he's right, because I had sort of said, OK, for now, until there's been legislative reform, it's a waste of time to file suit. What Justice Thomas said, combined with what they did last week, incentivize, says that, hey, maybe I'll get a, a judge to hear this particular kind of challenge. So I'll try to find the right fact pattern, right case to bring. Uh, and I will probably bring a case or two in the uh, forthcoming future on this subject. OK, I mean, it's that's that I think. I don't think we're going to get into more detail on this for the time being. We'll see where Section 230 goes. Uh, say it one more time, your proposal um, to remedy the, the deficiencies with Section 230. What, what could be the easy fix? Let big tech be held to the same rules as every mom and pop company in the country. When they lie to people, they get held responsible. When they're unjustly enriched, they get held responsible. When they falsely induce people into contracts to be to create content for them and then screw them over, they get to be held responsible like any other business. So just hold them to the same rules as everybody else. Excellent. What do we talk? Oh, oh, you know, before we get into the next topic, I just want to read three super chats that I think I may have missed. Andrew Torba, I, I'm going to be ignorant. I, someone said we should do a stream. I'm going to have to you know, uh, educate myself as to who you are. Um, the reason why Trump won't trust big tech is because big tech stocks are a huge percentage of the stock portfolio. Trust busts mm-hmm. big tech monopolies. Stock market be damned. Also get gab.com. Craig Lino, 504 says, is Congress totally bought by big tech? What laws can be passed to stop big tech from censorship? So we, we got that oh, as well. Yeah, you know, they just pre just make clear what Justice Thomas said about Section 230, allow them to be sued. And my additional component is to say that Section 230 is conditioned on them applying First Amendment standards and how they govern their ta- platforms. So that if they want the carrot of any kind of immunity, uh, they have to provide the stick of enforcing First Amendment standards on their platform. Okay, excellent. What do we move on to now? Do we want to do- election litigation was the next hot 